to arrive today at the heart of a great mystery, the center of the greatest mystery imaginable, a mystery beyond all mysteries, the Paschal Mystery, Good Friday, the day on which our Lord suffered and died for us, a day which is called good for a very good reason. It is the day of redemption. We recall from the Old Testament that this was hoped for, this was prefigured in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant will prosper. He shall be lifted up, exalted, rise to great heights. As the crowds were appalled on seeing him, so disfigured did he look that he seemed no longer human. So will the crowds be astonished at him, and kings stand speechless before him. For they shall see something never told, and witness something never heard before. Who could believe what we have heard? And to whom has the power of the Lord been revealed? Like a sapling, he grew up in front of us, like a root in arid ground. Without beauty, without majesty, we saw him. No looks to attract our eyes, a thing despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, a man to make people screen their faces. He was despised, and we took no account of him. And yet ours were the sufferings he bore, Ours the sorrows he carried, but we, we thought of him as someone punished, struck by God and brought low. Yet he was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sins. On him lies a punishment that brings us peace, and through his wounds we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking his own way, and the Lord burdened him with the sins of all of us. Harshly dealt with, he bore it humbly. He never opened his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughterhouse, like a sheep that is dumb before its shearers, never opening its mouth. By force and by law he was taken. Would anyone plead his cause? Yes, he was torn away from the land of the living, for our faults struck down in death. They gave him a grave with the wicked, a tomb with the rich, though he had done no wrong, and there had been no perjury in his mouth. The Lord has been pleased to crush him with suffering. If he offers his life in atonement, he shall see his heirs, he shall have a long life and through him what the Lord wishes will be done. My brothers and sisters, redemption, the sacrifice of Christ, is no arm's length transaction. Jesus, the head of his mystical body, and we, the members of that mystical body, we enter into redemption together together. The mystery of evil and suffering, the mystery of death, is a mystery indeed. It's something which has plagued mankind throughout the ages. The plaintive cry of humanity, why? Why suffering? Why pain? Why death? Why me? That cry echoes throughout the corridors of time. Why? We have to go back, as always, to the book of Genesis in order to gain insight and understanding into these great mysteries. We know that God created everything, and he declared it to be good, very good. It had to be good because the one who created it is goodness himself. And so everything in creation is good. Very good. Something happened, though, between the first chapter and the third chapter of the book of Genesis. 
We know that the serpent came on the scene in the third chapter, and he seduced Eve with a lie. If only you will disobey God, partake of that tree in the center of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if only you will do that, surely you will not die, because God had told them, if you partake of that tree or even touch it, you will die. But the devil, who Jesus would one day call a liar and the father of lies and a murderer from the beginning, says, oh, don't believe God. Surely you will not die. You will become like gods yourself, knowing what is good and what is evil. Imagine that. The father of lies is calling God a liar. Eve took the bait. She entered the big lie. And at that point, at that very point, pain, suffering, and death entered creation. A slight analysis of it might be helpful. Pride is the genesis of all of our problems. I'm talking about arrogance. I'm not talking about a healthy pride in your family, a healthy pride in your abilities at work. I'm talking about arrogance, a kind of pride that seeks to exalt the creature above the creator. A kind of pride which would have us believe that we're better than other people, forgetting where the goodness, where the grace, where the gifts come from. Pride. I can be like God. Nothing new under the sun. I can be like God. I can decide what is good and what is evil. I can play God. That's the promise of Satan. If only you will disobey God, you can become a little God, knowing what is good and what is evil. In other words, you make it up as you go along. You can decide subjectively and arbitrarily what is good and what is evil. Now, this is obvious today. We have it all over the place. A lot of people would like to make up the truth and attempt to do so. They don't receive the truth as something given. Our faith, which is the truth, the teaching of Jesus Christ, it is something which is given to us as a sacred deposit, a pearl of great price, a gift. Our business is to accept it in faith, to cherish it, to nurture it, to live in it. But if you don't like that truth, if you don't like some tenet of the faith, if you don't like part of the moral teaching of the church, you might buy into the serpent's lie. You might take the bait. You might decide you want to be God. What does God do? God brings something into being out of nothing. And so we begin to create our own reality. We begin to make up the truth. Oh, this or that isn't wrong. After all, we are people of the 90s. Uh, birth control, abortion, on and on. Well, that's not really a problem. We understand things better. We're enlightened. We're better educated. We make up our own truth. Rather than receiving what has been revealed, we seek to play God. We decide when life begins and when life ends. It's fatal. And so we have a culture which has rightly been called the culture of death. Why? Because we live out that original sin. We go with it. Pride, disobedience, death. From that moment in the Garden of Eden, the gates of heaven were closed. No one went to heaven, nor could they. From that moment on, we, in a sense, lived in a dismal place. Death was something to be feared. You didn't go to heaven after you died. Sheol, the abode of the dead. And it wasn't known to be a happy place. We were slaves, enslaved to sin, not having the power to truly live the way that we 
knew in our heart we should live, we limped through time and space. We were in need of a deliverer. We were in need of a savior, a redeemer. The Jewish people waited for the Messiah, the anointed of God. They waited, and they waited. The answer to the why of all that suffering, the answer to the anguish of every human heart, then, now, always, is not something, but somebody. The answer to every pain question is Jesus Christ. And there just isn't any answer. So stop wasting your time if you are. And I want you to take a good look at a crucifix. I want you to take a long, hard, discerning look at a crucifix on this Good Friday. And I want that glance at reality to transform you to change you from this moment on, no matter how good you are, and so many of you are such good people, or how bad you are, though your sins be as scarlet. On this day, they are washed clean by the blood of the Lamb if we say yes to redemption. We need to trust in God. We need to trust in the power of his redemptive sacrifice. We need to have hope. We need to have faith. We need to love. Maybe you're suffering right now. Good Friday is your day. Maybe you might agree with me. Sometimes I think Good Friday is my feast day. You might think it might be your feast day too. It is. It definitely is. It's the day that Jesus laid down his life willingly only to take it up again on the third day. Why? For you and for me. It is not some mere generic offering. I want you to know that it is for you personally. If the Lord Jesus had the chance to suffer and die for you and you alone, he would do it. In fact, he did do it. If you were the only one that God would ever create, he did it for you. You must believe that. Redemption's personal. Jesus, indeed, is a personal savior. Do you believe it? You better believe it. You have to believe it, because if you don't believe that, you're empty, and you're suffering very much. So today is the day. No matter what place you are in, you may be in a very dark place today. Some of you watching this may be enslaved to alcohol, to drugs, sex, pornography, whatever it is. You may be in a dark, dismal place. I tell you on this day, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings suffered for you personally. Accept that gift. Of redemption. I remember when I was in the seminary my first year I I didn't understand this business of suffering very well at that time and oh I didn't have any big sufferings but I remember that first semester was hard. I was older I think I was 39 years old when I went to the seminary and I met a another seminarian there, and I remember as we were struggling through the first weeks of our theology courses, we were having a hard time, and we used to get together to talk once in a while. This man I knew, this friend, had Lyme disease. He had contracted it at a time when they didn't know what it was, before they had gotten it more or less figured out. He suffered very much. Uh, I had minor things, migraine headaches, and sometimes we'd miss classes, and we couldn't figure out, we'd ask, God, Lord, you've brought us here to study, to be priests, now how are we going to do it if we're too sick to do it? Uh, some of you may be in a place where that's a reality. How am I going to do this? You might be a priest, you might be a religious, you might be a mom or a dad, anybody. 
How am I going to do this? How am I going to carry out this hard mission if I don't have my health? We used to talk about that, my friend David and I. Why? Why do bad things happen to good people? Once again, that great question, why? Today is the day where light is shed on that tremendous mystery. Why suffering? Well, there is a place in the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke helps us to understand part of the reason for suffering. We know that God sometimes wounds only to heal us. Sometimes God allows things to happen to us in order to bring greater things out of that. Why does God allow evil? That question. I once uh, watched a program on television. It was an interview of a, a great man, uh, Dr. Billy Graham, who's a wonderful Christian, a, a great evangelist, and David Frost was interviewing him. And at one point, uh, the topic of suffering came up. Why? Why does God, who is good by definition, why does God allow such suffering? And Billy Graham said, I don't know. It's a great, great mystery. And, and he's not all wrong. It is a great, great mystery. And he was telling the truth. Protestant theology, and we love all of our Christian brothers and sisters, it just does not provide the answer to that question. We know the answer. And the answer is this. God allows suffering only to bring a greater good out of it. And if you don't believe that, you have to take another look at the crucifix. Look at that. That is the greatest evil that ever took place. Why? It's deicide. Jesus is God, a divine person. Through his human nature, he suffered and died. That's doctrine. Jesus, a divine person, suffered and he died. He truly died. That's a horrible evil in itself. Creatures murder the Creator. And yet, it is the greatest good imaginable. That good is called redemption. That's what this day is about. Redemption. And so, yes, indeed, God permits evil. Why? Why do I have cancer? Why do the, all these people have AIDS? Why did my husband have to die so young? Why was my child killed before his time or her time? Why? Why such evil? There's only one answer. In order to bring a greater good out of it. The mystery of the prodigal son is something which helps us very much. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that falls to me. And he divided his living between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, and he took a journey to a far country. And there he squandered his property in loose living. And when he had spent everything, a great famine arose in the country, and he began to be in want. And so he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have fed himself on the pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? But I perish here with hunger. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose, and he went to his father's house. But while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion, 
and ran and embraced him. He kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring in the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and make merry. For this my son was dead. And now he lives. And they began to make merry. The prodigal son is every one of us. Every one of us at one time or another, in one way or another, has left our father's house. We've gone our own way. We've squandered the inheritance we've been given. We've sinned. This great parable of the prodigal son must speak to our heart this day. There is a power, a reconstructive power in suffering. Look what happened with the prodigal son. Now, he was from a well-off family. His family had flocks, they had wealth, and he was an heir. But one day, something got into him, and he said, let me get out of here. Maybe he was bored. Maybe he was tired of it all. Maybe his father, well, he never really gave him anything. That's what he, the, the older son said later. And so he took off with his share of the inheritance. Now and then, maybe we do that. We take off, and we squander the riches which God has bestowed upon us. In my own life, I can say that I was the prodigal son, rather big time. And the predictable happened. Maybe you've gone through something like that. We squander what we've been given, the inheritance of the faith, this great legacy of our Catholic faith. We turn to sin. We go from bad to worse. One day we might find ourselves in a very bad place. I remember I suffered very much for years. It was so bad I wondered what could this be so horrible. I lost everything. I had achieved myself the American dream, wealth, everything, power, prestige, money. Then I was reduced to nothingness, all of it taken away, my health taken away. Why? Because God was punishing me? No, because God loved me. Why have all these things happened to you? Because God loves you. And you say, how can that be? How can a God of goodness and mercy allow this? Because he loves you. You want me to tell you something else? I'm not going to tell you something else. I'm going to tell you the truth. All that stuff has come down on you because God loves you. But I've lost all my money. Oh, how blessed you are. I've even lost my health. Oh, how blessed you are. Why am I blessed, I feel? Those who did not understand looked at him, lifted up on a cross, and thought he was cursed. Scripture even said so. Whoever is lifted up on a tree is accursed. But we know that he wasn't cursed, but blessed. And we know that in him we are blessed. How can the servant be any different from the master? The way he went is the way we must go. He went by way of the cross. We go by way of the cross. You know, you lose a lot of people here in our Christian faith. I can talk about all kinds of things. I can talk about praising the Lord in people like that. I can talk about doing good works in people like that. I can talk about feeding the poor and doing other works of mercy, people will go along with that, and, well, they should. You can do pretty well with Christianity until you come to the cross. And when you begin to talk about the mystery of the cross, many people begin to filter away. It is a hard saying. We look at that, 
and we just don't want to go there. And that's understandable. That's very understandable. It is a difficult place to go. It is a difficult thing to endure. But there's no other way than the way of the cross. The lives of the saints prove this. There isn't a single saint who lived that didn't suffer tremendously. Oh, the suffering takes different forms. It doesn't have to be physical. It could be emotional, spiritual. But whatever form it takes, you cannot, you cannot be sanctified unless you enter into the Paschal Mystery. For entering into the passion, death, and resurrection of the Lord means to enter into Jesus himself. For you cannot separate the Lord from his mission. Christ and his mission are one. His mission is redemption. How did he accomplish it? On a cross, through death, ordained towards resurrection. You have a mission. I have a mission. What is the mission? The mission is simple. It is the very same mission of the Master. We're not different from him. We're members of him. We're part of him. His way is our way, and there is no other way. And so just cut it out if you're trying to beat around the bush or escape from your cross. Don't run from the cross. You run from the cross, you run from love. St. Teresa of Avila, tremendous doctor of the church, great foundress of the Discalced Carmelite Order, would often say, love is the cross, and the cross is love. Don't run from the cross. You run from the cross, you run from love. You run from the cross, you run from your mission. You run from the cross, you run from salvation. Don't run from the cross. Embrace it. Easy to say, I know. Easy to say. Hard to do. I'm not any better at it than you are. I admit that. And we look at this difficult mission and say, but how, Father, I'm weak. And I say, amen, brother. I'm weak too. But I'm afraid, so am I. I don't think I can do it. Neither can I. But he already did it. He won the victory, and we have that victory in him, but you have to enter into that victory. You do it a moment at a time, one little step at a time. The Chinese have the saying, the longest journey still requires that the first step be taken. Oh, we're on a journey, all right. And that journey leads to a very steep mountain, a torturous ascent, it's rocky, difficult, filled with snares and traps. And it ends on a stark mountaintop called Calvary. And there, amidst a somber Judean sky, the Son of God was lifted up on a cross. And when we look at him, we have to see ourselves. I remember one of the great days of my life. I was preaching in Texas. San Antonio, and I was the only priest there, and I was hearing confessions. One particular day, I heard confessions for 18 hours in a 24-hour period. I preached for three hours, and it doesn't take much to figure out when, any time for anything else, but 18 hours, I heard confession, and it was amazing. I was in a little chapel. There was a crucifix, and the people would come in, one after the other, broken, wounded with every tale of woe and pain and suffering. Oh, Father, my son was killed in a gang fight. Oh, Father, my daughter is on drugs. Father, my husband ran away with my best friend. I'm dying myself. One after the other, hour after hour after hour, got to be about 5 o'clock in the morning. The last one came in, and she poured out the most painful story I'd ever heard. All of those 
stories, those pains, they were diverse. But my response was not, it was one. I realized at that time that I had been pointing to that crucifix, and I did it with this last woman, and I pointed to the crucifix, and I said, what do you see? I see Jesus on the cross. What else do you see? Well, that's all. I see the Lord on a cross. I see, I see some, I said, I see something else. I see something else. I see you on that cross. I see you lifted up on that cross. You are in great pain. You are suffering very much. Now, realize where you are. Realize what this means. Realize what your life is all about. You know, being lost is a painful thing, a frightening thing. You're lost, you don't know quite where you came from, and you don't know where you're going. We have a lot of lost people today. A lot of people who don't know where they came from, who don't know where they are headed, and who don't know where they are at any given moment. That identity crisis that I referred to before. Painful thing to be lost. I can tell you how to get your bearings. If you feel lost, if you are in darkness, if you are in pain and suffering, you just don't know where you came from, you don't know where you're headed, and you don't know what your life's all about. I can tell you. Look at that crucifix, see Jesus, and realize that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creatures. And then remember, we are created in the image, the image of God. Who's the image of God? Jesus is the image of God. He is the firstborn of all creation, the first of many brothers. You and I are in him. He is the exemplar. But you say, Father, Jesus is Lord. He's God. I'm not God. I can't do it. He's strong. I'm weak. And remember what the Word of God says at that point. It is in weakness that I am strong. God's mighty power is brought to perfection in weakness. When you're powerless, remember that when the darkness closes in. And so, yes, we have pain, we have suffering, but do we realize the power? The power of an act of the will. You know the fact that we're made in the image and likeness of God, do you know what that means? Primarily it means that we have an intellect. We are capable of self-reflection, we are capable of knowing the truth. The proper object for the intellect is truth. What's the truth? We struggle today with the truth. We say it's this, that, or the other thing. Philosophers have been searching for it for centuries. This, that, and the other religion claims to have the truth. We know what the truth is. The truth isn't something. The truth is somebody. Jesus is the truth. We have to enter into his life in order to have peace and joy. And so to become mature, to be actualized in our potential, we have to embrace the life of Christ, which is a life of sacrifice, a life of pain at times, a life which will end in death, a death which will end in resurrection. Once our Lord told one of his saints something very interesting. He told St. Paul of the cross, suffering endears men to me, Suffering endears men to me. Shall I say it again so it sinks in? I better. Suffering endears men to me. Remember that the next time we suffer. It endears us to Christ. Because a suffering man or woman resembles me. Suffering is a hidden blessing precious beyond purchase. And if a man knelt before God for a hundred years and begged for the privilege to suffer, he would not deserve it. 
It converts a worldly man into a heavenly man. Suffering makes a man a stranger to the world and gives him instead my continual intimacy. It increases, or it decreases friends, but increases grace. That's what the Lord himself had to say about suffering. It makes us resemble Christ the Lord. You can let that go in one ear and out the other, or you can let it sink in. You let it go in one ear and out the other, let me assure you of something. You will go nowhere in the spiritual life. You will stay mired down in the mud of mediocrity. But if you will today on this good Friday, this day of redemption, if you will accept that reality that we must embrace the cross, if you will accept what God sends, oh, don't ask for things. We'll get enough without asking for any pains or suffering. Accept what he sends. All the saints suffered greatly. Sometimes you and I suffer too, but... Isn't it a joy, really, to realize that because we're in Christ, we are contributing to the salvation of not only ourselves. You know, if I thought I'm doing it just for me, I don't think I could do it. Believe it or not, I just don't think I could do it. But knowing that it contributes to the salvation of others. Remember all your friends from high school, all the people you've known in the course of your life, not to mention your children or your parents or your relatives. Think of all those souls. And then think about eternity. And then remember that there are only two places ultimately, heaven and hell. Now what would you do to get even one of them home? Home to our Father's house. That is the meaning of life. Don't get sidetracked. We worry about a thousand and one different things, trivial things in the end. How much money we have. Can I afford this, that, or the other thing? In the end, there's only one thing that matters. It's called heaven. That's why Jesus suffered and died on this good Friday. And that's why it's good. Because he did precisely that. And your life and mine will be good to the degree and only to the degree that we enter into his life and his death. For dying, he destroyed our death. And rising, he restored our life. And so we pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. There's a cosmic warfare in process. Every one of us is a warrior. Every one of the baptized, especially we who have been given the fullness of faith in the Catholic Church, we have the fullness of redemption, the full means of salvation in seven sacraments. We've been given the weapons to fight the good fight. But many are being lost. Our Lady once said at Fatima, souls fall into hell like snowflakes. Because there is no one to pray and do penance for them. My brothers and sisters, does it matter to us that souls are being lost every minute? It's got to matter. Does it matter to us that millions are dead in sin? And you might say, oh, Father, but I can't do what you do. I don't preach. I can't minister that way. What can I do about it? You can do what Jesus did. Oh, Jesus was a teacher. He was a prophet. Jesus was a king, a leader. But more than anything, Jesus was a savior. How did he save? On a cross. And now you wonder what that cross in your life is about. It is about becoming who you are, a Christian. It is about making Christ present. It is about a mysterious operation of grace. It's a mystical thing. You say yes to God. You bow down in submission. Yes, Lord, 
Here I am, come to do your will. Yes, I accept it. It's hard. I don't even like it. But I accept it. You remember what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus went apart and he prayed. And what did he say? Perhaps what you and I might say in a moment like that. Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. It's not a bad prayer. You, you might say, Father, take this cancer from me. It's not a bad prayer. We can ask for healing. We can ask to be delivered. Jesus himself in his humanity prayed, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me, but, here's the punchline, but not my will, but yours be done. That is the bottom line of holiness. When a cross comes, when we are afflicted, when pain and suffering takes hold of us, when our light becomes darkness, when we can't take another step because it hurts so much, when we're misunderstood, persecuted, and we say, not my will, but yours be done. We must say it. We must stretch out our arms and be lifted up through him, with him, and in him. This cosmic warfare, this battle for souls rages on. I can well imagine that the good Lord looks about the earth for someone to help him. Oh, not that God needs help, absolutely speaking. No, of course not. We know he's God. He doesn't need it, but he wills it. He could have snapped his fingers and redeemed an infinity of universes. He's God. Certainly he could have done it that way, but he didn't. He willed to do it the way he did it. He willed to incorporate his church into his own life death and resurrection that means you and me we are in him and we have to live it out to the extent you do you will contribute to the salvation of souls love requires sacrifice are you willing to lay down your life for your friends your enemies. Jesus said, no greater love hath a man but that he lay down his life for his friends. We have to turn to Our Lady. We have to ask her to intercede for us. You know, she's the one that stood at the cross with the pious women in St. John, faithful to the last. She suffered everything in the enclosed garden of her immaculate heart that her son suffered on the cross. In the pristine recesses of her soul, the immaculate one lived out the passion. She knows all about pain and suffering. And you mothers who grieve for your children, the Blessed Mother knows all about it. And so from your place on the cross be united with her. Be one with the mother of the Lord. We know that we need strength to embrace that cross. And I tell you that that strength comes from the Eucharist. Last night, that holy night, that holy Thursday, the Lord Jesus instituted the priesthood in the Eucharist. And that Eucharist is power. That Eucharist is strength. People come to me all the time from places of pain. Father, I'm a slave to sin. I'm a slave to this sin and that sin and the other sin. I can't get away from pornography. I can't get away from lust. I can't get away from this, that, and the other thing. Do you want to? Yes. Then here's what you have to do. You have to enter into power. You have to go to confession. And then you have to go to Mass every day. And then you have to receive the Lord in Holy Communion. And until you do that, don't expect much. You're weak. 
your broken, sick people need help. And so you go to the divine physician. And then you can carry your cross. Then you have the power to fight the good fight and run the race to the finish line. My brothers and sisters, it's not easy. And I don't want to trivialize your pain nor mine. It's very difficult to remain faithful in the face of gross suffering, moral evil, persecution. Not easy, but possible. Remember the Lord went first. He won the victory. Will to enter into the victory. Will to become one with the one who set the captives free. Will to suffer with him, to die with him in order to rise with him. And I promise you this, if you do that, you will reign with him. You remember, I told you about my friend in the seminary, my friend David. One day he came to me and he said, pray for me because I have to go to the doctors. They're going to try to heal me of this Lyme disease. So I said, well, I'll certainly pray for you. And so he went off. He had to have a lot of tests to make sure he was strong enough to endure the, the treatment that he would be given. Came back about a week later, and he said, well, the physical showed that I have cancer. He was my age. We were in our early 40s at the time. He said, it's a bad form of cancer. It's melanoma in an advanced form, and they're going to do chemotherapy. Uh, please pray for me. Now, this man was in acquainted, he was well acquainted with infirmity. For many years, he had suffered. He had endured pain. He was indeed one of the Lord's best friends. You know, Padre Pio used to say, the greater your suffering, the greater God's love for you. Some people might say, well, could you love me a little less, Lord? <laughs> you remember that story from the life of St. Teresa of Avila, when she was making a foundation, traveling through the countryside, rainy day, the wagon wheel hit a rock, and it dumped her right into a ditch full of mud. Cold, miserable, and she looked up, and she said to the good Lord, Lord, if you treat your friends this way, no wonder you have so few of them. <laughs> Sometimes we feel that way. Well, David went and he had his chemotherapy. He would come to class. He sat next to me in most of our classes, and he looked sick. He went downhill gradually. He had to leave the seminary. We were to be ordained deacons at the end of that academic year. But David didn't make it. He had to leave and go to a hospice run by some good sisters. And all the seminarians would go to visit David on Sunday. The rector, a good man, a holy Franciscan priest, great theologian. He used it as a teaching tool. You know, you learn a lot in the seminary. You study philosophy and you study theology. But I tell you that this course that was being lived out in the Paschal Mystery taught me more than all of my other courses combined. We watched our brother suffer. We watched our brother lifted up on a cross. It was hard to look at, hard to fathom, and that cry rang out many a time, why? Why? He would be such a great priest. Why? And the suffering went on. I remember the last time that I ever saw my friend. I went into the hospice and I stopped in the chapel. I said a prayer. I walked down the corridor and 
It seemed as though grace wrapped itself around me. A sense of reverence came over me like when we come into the presence of the Lord. I opened the door and I walked into his room and there I beheld a scene which took me back 2,000 years. There David's mother was holding her son in her arms, the Pieta. David had wasted away, he'd been a 200 pound strong man and he was probably 80 or 90 pounds. And the perspiration was running down his face. He was in great pain. And his mother was wiping the perspiration from his brow. And he saw me and he motioned for me to come closer. Couldn't speak. So I knelt down and I put my ear next to his mouth. And he whispered in my ear, you can't believe the joy, the joy to suffer through with and in my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it was the last thing he ever sent, said to me. And he died within two days. And I was waiting with the rector and a couple of other seminarians on the steps of the seminary chapel with Sister Louis Marie, and she told us how he died. She was the sister who took care of him. She called for the priest. She knew he was dying, and the priest came. He had been in a coma. He lapsed into a coma, and the priest took the host from the pyx, and he lifted it up. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And David sat bolt upright out of a coma, and the priest went up to him, broke a piece of the host, and gave him viaticum, food for the journey, and the last three words out of his mouth were, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. And he fell down, and he breathed his last. But before he did, he told me, You can't believe. The joy, the joy of the cross, the power of the cross, as St. Paul said, and as every one of us must be able to say, it is now my joy to suffer for you as I fill up in my poor human flesh that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ sake of his body, the church.